Welcome to the Speak Pack Podcast, where high performing speakers and the producers who hire them merge to give you the insider secrets to the lucrative speaking industry. Antonia Rose, your podcast host and celebrated speaker agent, unveils insider success strategies. Discover a nexus of thought leaders and bookers, maximizing your potential in each and every episode. Your ticket to ultimate speaking success begins right here. Catch the transformative insights waiting for you on the Speak Packed podcast, hosted by the industry powerhouse herself, Antoniette Rose. We have Todd Blylevin with us, and wow, what a story. And also, even more importantly than than some of his major kind of milestone stories, but also the the structure behind his life as as a whole. It's a very interesting journey how he took those pieces and has created a massive following and a pretty nice blooming and growing speaking career for himself. Mm-hmm. So welcome to the stage, Todd. So glad to have you. Well, thank you, Antoniette, to speak of your culture in Italian, but I'm truly honored to be here. I appreciate you coming on. It's been a long time waiting to get an opportunity to speak with you and your audience. So thank you for having me. Yes. Well, we're going to dive into some deep waters here. Let's just start with a little bit about you. We're not going to go into your full resume. That'll kind of unwrap itself as we go along. But you're a TEDx speaker. You have over 120,000 plus fans and probably even more than that, right? Between your different platforms, your email list, all the things. That's massive. We all really strive to that solid following. But what it speaks to is you have really struck a chord with people, right? They want, they're, they're seeing something in your story and in your journey that is transforming their lives. So I know that you're predominantly in the sports world. You work more than full-time. You've got several different hats and those will unveil, unveil as we go. But what I love about that is there are a lot of speakers saying, oh boy, I wish I had time to, to get my voice out there. I really wish I you know, could write that book or, or start really breaking into the speaking arena. Well, you've done it despite all of that. So I love that you're a TEDx speaker. You, had, you have a script written about you from one of your kind of cornerstone stories of that t- horrible 27 Las Vegas mass shooting, right? And you were a hero in all of that. So where to begin? Where do we begin? Why don't we just begin with how did you take all of that and say, you know what? I think people need to to hear some things that I have to say. Like, how did that first start? We were clicked to you and you started getting your voice out there and and, and landing stages. You know, I I grew up in a major league baseball household with my dad, Burt Blyleven, playing professional baseball. And, you know, when you grow up in that lifestyle, you're taught to be tough. You're taught to be resilient, adaptive. You know, you hold a lot of your emotions in. You certainly don't talk about your fears or or raise your hand and say, hey, I'm not feeling well today. I'm a little mentally fatigued. You don't say that. You push through it. You grind through it. You get over things. And, you know, I played professional baseball as a major league baseball scout. I lived in that world. I grew up with that mentality. And all of a sudden in that tragic incident, which I know we'll get into, the aftermath of what that does to you and the trauma that absolutely tears you down. And we all have that, right? It doesn't, you don't have to go through a mass shooting in order to be knocked down and to feel traumatized in any uh, sense of whatever that word means to you. But what I realized was um, as I was giving all of these interviews on a global level and being interviewed by all these you know, international markets, that it dawned on me through one podcast, there was the first responder organization out of Fairfield County, Connecticut, and they wanted to focus more on the aftermath. Yes, we know that you went through this. Anybody can go back and and watch your story on what you've been talking about. But what did that feel like when all of a sudden you were able to walk tall again for yourself, stand back up for yourself, talk about the event and actually remember it and process it and keep my trauma out in front of me? And as I started to talk more about that over the last probably year and a half to two years, I've the audience just is in cap. They just listen, and you can hear a pin drop. 
So in some of the speeches that I've given, the more I focus on the uprise and talking about how to become resilient and and be vulnerable and empathetic and what a traumatic event does to you in terms of, yes, there's horrible, bad things that happen. But on the bright side, as you start to learn more about yourself, there's these sensories that evolve that are updated, the chance to love more, the chance to give back more, the chance to be able to share your story and provide a potential survival guide for somebody. And that's where I've really been focusing more of my attention. I've really been trying to to build more models around uh, how my immediate traumatizing experience can grab your attention. And now I have your heart. What can I do with that? And how can I instill that love and resilience factor and hopefully give you a pathway to, to be able to walk out of there and say, I'm relatable to that person. I experienced something in the aftermath that's relatable. And now you've literally just given me an opportunity to walk tall for myself. And that's my whole goal. And that's where it's shifted. So I hope that gives you an idea on when I got really excited over the last year and a half to really start speaking and get out because I feel like it's something that I've been pulled to talk about and tell and share. I'm a very faith-based uh, person and I feel more people need to hear it. So. Well, you definitely have a gift of connecting with the audience. I do want to go Thank more you. into that as we go, but there's a few kind of keywords that you were just sharing that I want to just highlight because I'm hearing it. Not only am I hearing it a lot, we're seeing as, because I am a speaker agent, I have a speaker agency. So as, as these organizations are, are inquiring about speakers, there are a few really key words. And you said all, you said three of the top ones, resilience, empathy, and vulnerability. Three words that are very important, especially post-pandemic, right? Nobody's feeling completely solid, completely like the foundation is going to be there for them all the time, right? At any moment, that that rug can be pulled out from underneath our feet again, right? And so because we're feeling that little bit of what can happen next, right? Nothing is as perfect as we thought it was. Everything we've built, even the the, the more stable of us, right? That great big house with the nice pool in the backyard, our kids at the the most expensive schools, whatever, all that can be pretty much taken away. I mean, your house becomes your prison. Nobody can swim or come back to your barbecues and your kids can't go to their fancy school. And then those who are maybe in in less stable situations, we're all kind of on on this playing field together. Folks, you're, you're a sports guy. I'll utilize that. And it's it's being recognized and felt from the corporate level to organizations to just kind of the world at large so being able to be vulnerable especially as a as an athletic man right and, and kind of that macho sports space that's just dis, that's disarming in a great way that helps bring down the walls to show your resilience and we'll we'll dive into your story in a bit but You speak from a place of empowerment, not victimhood, while you were traumatized. I mean, you can't go through what you went through without there being some residual of that. But we speak from our our scars versus our open wounds when we get up in front of people and want to really utilize that experience that we lived through in a powerful, positive way, not not to toot our horns or to have anybody feel sorry for us, but to really utilize that experience. You're a faith-based man, right? Things happen for reasons. What was the reason? What's the good that came from such a tragic situation? Well, you, you do that through showing your resilience and your empathy. Obviously, you put other lives before your, your own during that pretty incredible time. So those three key pieces, if people can just dial into that, you alluded to, we all, we've all gone through something, right? We've all yeah. had things in our lives that in a perfect world, we would have written the script differently, right? But we, we, we lived through that. So how can those then help us help others? And you've really dialed into that. Was what came first? Was it the TEDx talk because of this experience that came first or did you start getting invited to stages? Did you do the outreach to get on to, to different platforms and in, in front of microphones? How did it all begin for you? It really began immediately 
during the event towards the last hour of what happened in Las Vegas. And we can get into that when you're ready. But, yeah. you know, it was an interview and it started with interviews. It started with then TV cameras coming out to my house. It, it you know, I, I've always been around media. My, I grew up in a professional household. I played professional baseball. I was a major league. I've always been around media. So none of that really bothered me, but it was with my particular story, it really started more interviews and then it grew into podcasts, being guests on multiple podcasts, running my own podcasts, whether it was in sports, whether it was a co-hosted podcast on trying to provide strength and resilience and spread that message to all of a sudden the TEDx stemmed off of a podcast and through a friend that saw that fell in love with my story, fell in love with what how it impacted her. And all of a sudden the TEDx people were like, oh my gosh, like your story is incredible. And to be honest, if I, go, I look back on my TEDx story now and it was very focused on pretty much one moment of 13 seconds in, my, in, my, in that eight hour uh, odyssey. However, I look back on it now and I wish I would have spent less time talking about the 13 seconds and more time talking about what I really love to talk about now and what we just spoke of is the resilience piece, the empowerment. I am, yes, I'm a victim, I'm a survivor of a mass shooting. I saw horrible, horrible things, but I'm empowered. I am stronger than anything that you could ever imagine. I'm stronger than a rock, I'm stronger than steel. I lift myself up every single day and I tackle this world of adversity and craziness and chaos because I never know what's going to happen in my next 10 minutes, but I'm going to be prepared for that because of how strong I am on the inside, how confident I am, and how much I have control over my trauma now. I've learned through amazing techniques, and we can get into that stuff too, if you like, with EMDR therapy and the aftermath, my peer support group. And just my daily routine of what I go through when I get out of the bed and I fold my sheets a certain way and I pat my pillow down a certain way and I say a prayer for myself, okay, let's go. Be passionate today. Be kind. Pray for more love in this world and let's go. And that little piece right there is, is nothing different than when I used to toe up on the rubber, have bases loaded, have a batter at the plate wanting to knock those runs in and 10,000 people screaming and yelling in the stands and I'm ready to go. It's the same mentality. The football player putting in the mouthpiece, getting ready for the, the you know play on the line, you're ready to dive in and score the touchdown. It's that mentality you have to replicate and be consistent with every single day to tackle where we're at. So yeah, I love speaking about resilience, but that's really where it started. And then the TEDx launched the opportunity for me to get out and speak on stage, which I absolutely love and I want to do much more of. I feel I'm a passion speaker. I don't speak from a script. I Yes, I've scripted somewhat of a beginning and I script an end because I want to make sure that I'm hitting those marks and setting people up for what I'm about to speak on. But when I really start speaking, I'm, I'm going with the audience. I love picking out five or six different people. I go off of their emotions. And when I see too much crying, I'll back it off. If I don't see enough, well, I'm going to pour it on because I really want you to feel what I feel every single day. And I feel like that's the faith part of me that comes out where I was put into a position to be able to help hundreds of people survive. But in the end, I don't think that was the story. I think that was just a story to open up act one. And act two and three and four are what you just spoke about is how do you empower someone with becoming vulnerable when they're not vulnerable, like me? How do you install empathy and care and love? And how do you become resilient and strong so you can battle with what you're about to encounter every day yeah. and stay positive, right? So mm -hmm. yeah, that's where it started. Okay, so much, so much there. And sorry. <laughs> no, it's yeah. a, in a good way. And I, I'm just trying to decide which direction to go because there's so much I want to dive in with you. Your story is out there everywhere. When If people really want to get the nitty gritty of your story, they can go to your TEDx. We'll make sure to list some of these key links and get the fullness of 
what you went through. I'd like I'd like for this show maybe a three minute version of it because I really do want to dive into you taking that experience and the other experiences in your life as a pro athlete, as a scout, as somebody who can, you know, help pick out the, the up and coming pro athletes, all of those kinds of things, how you made these things that number one, you were passionate about, the lessons from what you're passionate about and the lessons from experience you had no control over and culminated that into now being a sought after voice, right? That's what I'd like to focus the most time on. We'll definitely put links to the full length of your story, but if you just want to do high level, quick three minutes, because we've piqued everybody's curiosity on that, I'll take the stage. <laughs> I, I really appreciate you setting that up for me, and it gives me parameters to stay within. So I appreciate that because I can talk a lot about that night. Sure. You know, to summarize it, and certainly you can learn more, as you mentioned, online and, and just search my name. But I was in Las Vegas in, in October 1st, 2017, with about 18 family, friends, my wife, my brother in law, his wife, watching a country artist that we all loved. It was a three-day country fest, 26,000 people across the street from Mandalay Bay. And while this artist, Jason Aldean, was singing on stage to one of our favorite songs, I found myself dancing with my niece and all my family members were all encircling us. It was all younger kids to people our age that were taking their cameras out and almost like we were just on stage and you start to hear popping sounds. And immediately you get into this heightened sense of alert. And to fast forward, turns out there was a gunman 32 stories up uh, across the street at Mandalay Bay that decided to open up uh, fire using machine guns down on all of us. And we were directly in line in the first uh, two waves of gunfire where people around us were being hit. At that time, you're telling everybody to get down. And then I... Thank God I realized it was coming from above us to our right. So I told everybody to get up and run out. Mm. And so we started to run away from the gunfire. You know, as you're running, every step that you take, you don't know if it's going to be your last because bullets are flying by you. And all I wanted to do was keep my wife in front of me and protect her as much as I could to do whatever I could to get her out of the venue. And thank God we were able to get to a certain location. My goal was to get to this booth and then run out the gates. And once we got out the gates, I had achieved my goal, gotten my wife and family to safety. And I pushed them to go keep running away from the gunfire. And I ran back in. I knew people were going to be hurt. I knew people were going to be down. The gunfire was still going on. I ran in and out multiple times and being shot at. I carried women and men over my shoulders, in my arms. I lost five women that night, three in my arms, one that I tell a story of called my 13-second memory, where a young girl took her last breath in my arms and I laid her down as gently as I possibly could. And you stand up and you just, you question like, why is this happening? Why, why is this happening to us, to her? And all of a sudden there's this strength, like this embrace. And so I pour water over myself, you get re-energized and you just stay on task. All I'm going to do is I'm going to keep running in and out until either I fall or somebody tells me to stop. <clears throat> so that went on for about eight hours. It ended with uh, me getting out approximately over 200 people after all the people have come back after math through Facebook and message saying, thank you. I ended up tackling a man with a knife that was waving it around over at Tropicana, guarding about 250, 300 people inside of a building because we all thought we were under attack for eight hours. Nobody knew that it was a single gunman. We thought the whole Vegas Strip was exploding and all these different things. Police were scattered everywhere, and finally two SWAT officers came up to me and three other individuals, a fire captain from San Francisco, an off-duty EMT from Vegas, and a Marine, and said, sir, you can stand down. And at that point, I dropped to my knees. The silence just overcame me. 
But at that point, so many people came up and they were putting their hands on me and helped me stand back up. And it was just one resilience piece after another, one inspiring story after another, one heroic moment after another that I kept witnessing. And when I got home, I didn't know what to do. And so a gentleman called me that had three tours of combat experience. A friend of my dad said, this is what you're going to do. Here's your 72 hours lifeline. This, you're going to have headaches. Your speech is going to be impaired. I want you to call me. And I did. And I was, that was my first real touch of being vulnerable and completely broken. And I embraced it. And I, it was one friend after another, mostly first responders that have been through a relatable post experience like that. But all of them kept saying, even combat vets have not been what you went through. You didn't go in with a gun in your hand. You didn't go in to defend someone. You went in literally exposing your body to save someone else. And the hero term has been dropped a lot on me, but I'm not a hero. I'm just somebody that was in the right place at the right time. And I think God really wanted me to He use me as his vessel to go in and help where I could. And that's all I was trying to do was just help people. And that's the story of Las Vegas. But the aftermath is really the story on, on how I stood back up. Well, okay. Wow. Right. It'd be easy to want to camp right here for the, for the duration of our time together, because there's so many questions and, you know, where did you find the strength and did, did you, were you even thinking, or was it just on automatic, right? All of those, those, I would just love to sit with you for three hours. Right. But we're going to take that incredibly traumatic experience. I mean, a young girl in your arms, like, oh my goodness, right? There's so many, so we definitely camp out right here. We're going to take that and talk about the, the depth of that emotion, right? You had me in tears, how you alluded it to, you alluded to this a little bit ago. How do you take a story that is highly emotional and take people to that emotional space, but also bring them back up so that they they don't get lost down there and and lose the the over overriding message of resilience, vulnerability, empathy, healing. I'd love to get into the EDMR that you dove into so that you could be the man that you are today, that man of faith who's still highly productive. We'll get into some of the projects that you're working on big, right? And you're a family man and all the other things, right? You didn't allow that to freeze you in time. You were able to get past that. So let's talk a little bit about how do you relive that story over and over in your talks mm -hmm. and not get drugged down by the emotion of it and not allow your audience to kind of camp out there so that they don't get to hear the bigger message. Yeah, you know, it's something that when you experience any t any form of trauma, you think about it every day. There might be a trigger that pops up that reminds you of, of something that you went through that's horrible back in your past. With me, I think about it every day, probably multiple times in the day. I lose sleep at night. I still have my nightmares. I'm never going to get rid of that. I'm never ever going to get over that. So I've trained myself through EMDR therapy, which allows you to basically process each minute of time that I went through in that traumatic event and cry about it, which is really big for me because I'm not a crier. But in that moment in space, when I was able to find a, a experienced therapist that I could really latch on to, and I knew that by, by telling her Everything that had happened to me from the goriest details to the screams to everything else that was so bad and horrible to the inspiring moments as well, she was going to be able to take it. She was, it wasn't going to scar her because she had heard some of these types of things before. So that was really big for me was finding a relatable therapist first. Going through EMDR therapy was amazing to me because it allowed me to process each one of those minutes, put it into a black box behind me on a shelf, categorize everything so I could remember what I had done and what had happened to me and how a trigger in walking into a crowded environment could impact me. And so it was learning like what your new spidey senses were like, right? 
trying to figure out how I would be. And if I walked into a restaurant and I sat with my back to the door, which I never really do anymore. So now I always sit with my back up against the wall so I can see everything. How I'm, why am I like so vigilant and checking out exit points? Why am I so vigilant in, in body scanning people when we're in a crowded situation? Why am I so vigilant in making sure the security is, is where it should be? All these little checkpoints you learn from. And I think that's the storyline. So when I'm telling the story and I've got you where I, I really want you as a speaker because I want you to feel what I felt, that's my job now. I want you to, I don't want you to see what I saw. I want you to feel what I felt. Mm. I don't want you to have those nightmares that I have. I don't even, I don't, my wife doesn't even know everything that I've gone through because she Luckily, was able to, you know, someone let her into their into their uh, condo. Twenty six people. They barricaded the place. She was safe. Thank God for. I mean, four individuals that were complete angels that let all those people in. But she doesn't even know. But she knows my heartbeat. And when I take you through that journey, it now then becomes an uplift. And I start it with my my conversation with Lee, the combat vet. It goes on to my friend Chad, that's a firefighter out in, out in Rockland, California, that talks about EMDR therapy. All of a sudden, I realized I need this peer support group that's relatable to me because I can't talk to my dad. I can't talk to my mom. I can't talk to my wife. I can't talk to my, my sports buddies. Everybody is so supportive, but they don't share a relatable experience of knowing what that silence feels like. And in any type of trauma that we all go through, we we have, there's this moment of silence, a moment of pause, a moment where we question what the heck did just, what happened right there? How do I now get through this? What am I going to do? Oh my gosh, I lost somebody or this happened to me. This is horrible. What do I do? So it's that moment of silence that we've all experienced. And I talk about how I was able to get through that silence and recognize when that silence is starting to creep back up on me and how I relax myself, how I separate. And so it instantly transitions now into an education play, right? And then it's relatable to so many different people. And in my conversations, I've had Navy SEALs pull me aside and say, hey, what you just spoke about in the aftermath of your silence, I've been going through that for 20 years with a combat vet or a combat situation where one of my buddies almost died and I just don't even know what to do. And I said, have you called him? Have you talked to him? Have you been vulnerable? Because I'm a big, tough guy. Nobody's ever going to tell me that I'm not strong. Nobody's ever going to tell me that I'm not tough. I've done tough things before Vegas happened. I've helped people pull them out of cars, pulled a, a man out of a burning truck. I'm not afraid to go into the battle or, or the heat of everything and, and put my life on the line. But in that moment, now I'm learning that vulnerability is tougher than everything that I've ever done on the physical side. Being vulnerable and sharing your emotions and sharing your feelings, that's where real communication starts. And it fosters all the way into the business sense, into the sports side, from the coach being vulnerable, allowing those athletes to talk to the coach about their interpersonal feelings, allowing the regular worker to talk to their to their CEO because he's approachable, he's vulnerable, he's empathetic. That's how innovation is fostered. And I've just, through my corporate career, kind of put all that together. And I thought, you know, this is what we should really be talking about. This is where we're hitting blocks in our society. And what's it all revolve around? Love. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the biggest piece in my heart that had come out really through that, that entire event losing those women in my arms, hearing the stories, it impacts me every day, but it drives me. It makes me who I am. It allows me to be a better dad. It allows me to be a better person in society. I am so happy with the person that I am and how I feel I can give back to this world. And that's empowerment, right? So. Yes, okay. We didn't plan this, Todd, obviously, we could have never planned this conversation that you and I are having two days after an active shooter event, right? An assassination yeah. attempt on, yeah. on former President Trump. What was pretty striking to me, and I'm sure as you saw that, it had to have triggered you, like it had to have 
brought some some major things up for you. What I found pretty stunning was people were not running and scrambling and harming each other to get out of harm's way. Even right there behind the former president, they stood their ground. Right? I was just like, why aren't you guys running? Like, you don't know if there's more than one shooter, if he's, you know, under control or not, but they stood their ground. And I'm certain that you couldn't have predicted your reaction in that situation. I mean, how could you? But the fact that you put your own self as once you, your family was safe, you put your own, you volunteered, right? To put your own self back in harm's way. And who knows how many lives get to see the rest of their days because of that. And you do it very humbly, which is pretty fascinating and, and inspiring, very beautiful. But that whole scenario, you've chosen to utilize that story to transform, to impact, to propel your audiences, not to gain a hero status or scar the audience with, with the gory details right? And not even scar your wife with some of those details that should really just between be between you and, and your therapist. As hard as that was, you just said these words, and I, I'm probably not going to quote you verbatim, but that becoming a vulnerable man in this path to resilience was one of the hardest things you've ever done. Like after hearing this story, for you to say that was one of the hardest things, that you've ever done is, is pretty telling at, at the strength of vulnerability to be able to make, first of all, heal yourself. And then second of all, make something beautiful out of something that was so horrible. You know, you touched on so much and I really appreciate your kind words. It's a feeling inside of me that it's working talking about our, our emotions, our vulnerability, it's working. If I'm impacting you, I'm impacting others. And all we're trying to do is help each other. And unfortunately, a couple of days ago, we had an, that assassination attempt on our president or our former president. And lost, and, and lost a human life out of that. And it wasn't just, human lives. It, and it's so sad. And it wasn't just an, an attempt on an individual, it was an attempt on destroying society. It was an attempt to bring down people. And in a moment when you're, when you're caught in that fire, you're really taught to drop, identify where you're at, identify your exit points, find safety, find security, and then run. You shouldn't just turn around and run. That's the worst thing you wanna do because you don't know where you're going. But in that moment, and I wrote an article on this and posted it up on LinkedIn uh, yesterday. The former President Trump has something now truly unique, and so does everybody else there. And my, my hat goes off to all of the Secret Service men and women that put their lives and shielded him immediately and everything else that took place and all the bravery in that eight seconds of time that happened. But now you're, you're going to have an individual that is coming out of a situation thanking God, number one, that that bullet missed him for the most part. It hit his ear, but thanking God that he's alive. He's going to be more appreciative towards life. He's going to have more love in his heart. He's going to have more empathy. He's going to have more strength, more resilience. It's not something that most people walk away from thinking, oh, I'm more cocky now. I'm this and that. There's a new touch, a new sensory update on him that he got in that instant moment and that he's going to be walking with. And everybody that has witnessed that now, we all feel the compassion, regardless of how we felt about him as an individual or the other or, or our president or whatever, all this stuff is going on. It's a feeling that I wish could be replicated amongst all politicians, amongst all leaders, where you could truly not be in that situation. I don't want anybody to be shot at. But the feeling of aftermath, where you are completely broken, it's a complete reset to learn how to live and love. And all of a sudden, and it's no joke, but the butterflies are so peaceful. 
the surrounding skies. I see butterflies now and I just I I think they're like they're amazing. I I it just the way it touches you, the way it touches your heart, the compassion that you have for others, you hold doors open for people because you know what life and death and how quickly it can be taken. And, and unfortunately, we've had family members that have, that we've lost, whether it was tragically or hopefully peacefully in the end, in, in the middle of the night. But to have something so horrific happen and evil strike down, the greater of man mankind is stepping up now, the resilience, the empowerment. So I'm excited to see what happens here as our nation comes together. And I'm already hearing that a lot of the bad stuff that they were campaign, campaigning against each other are now starting to get removed. Hopefully that continues and it becomes something, and we don't need to get into politics, but this is what happens when you step out of a tragic event like this. And it happened to me. And so I think it's, it, I use this coin phrase a lot, love wins. Yes. Um, you said that wins. a couple of times. Let's incite love. Let's incite peace. Let's incite yeah. appreciation for even the smallest things around us, that butterfly flying by, right? And stop focusing so much on getting our way, our, our perfect candidate, our things that we want, right? I think at the end of the day, humans are human. They want what what's best for the world. I really believe the average person human wants what's best. We just have different approaches to get there. Why hate each other over it? Let's let's replace the hate button with the love button. And I love that you've brought that up. That has to be at the foundation of everything. And from there, we can get things done, right? You may you may have a path I don't agree with to get to to some of the ultimate goals of bettering society. But at the end of the day, we're both human and we both want what we, what, what's best for people, right? We just have different roads there. So let's talk about that in an open go give way without all of the inciting of the hate talk and, you know, and, and all sides are, are guilty of it, right? Mm -hmm. Hopefully as a globe, having witnessed what we all witness, definitely as North Americans. And I have been like you, I have been starting to see where people are like, what, snap out of it, right? What have we been doing? Let's just, let's just talk about some solutions. Let's talk about some common ground. Well, I think when you, you know, what we're talking about today is trying to find that resilience, how to become more vulnerable, more empathetic, I think when you talk about drama and how our society is just filled with it, when you when you when you talk about drama to a first responder, you talk about drama to a military combat vet, when you talk about drama to somebody that's experienced a traumatic event, drama to them is this big. If it gets to be this big, they're not going to deal with it because life itself means so much more and they've seen so much worse. So it's not worth their time. And that's the biggest part is how do you prioritize the time that you spend worrying about things that are really out of your control? Control your own environment. Control who you are. Have peace with your faith if you're faithful. Have peace with your inner being if that's what you want to do. But have peace with yourself first. Enjoy who you are as a human being. Make those modifications day by day if you're unhappy with yourself. Make sure that you're, you're using your voice to speak your mind and be strong about that and convicted with what you're trying to say. And if we can get to that point where we have inner peace, you're going to have a lot more people walking around with a smile on their face. And then we're kind to each other. And if you're feeling like I'm down or I'm out, then just go be extra kind to someone else because it lifts you up. It lifts your spirit up, right? But the drama part in our society has just gotten to be so crazy. And it starts with our TV coverage and everything else. But in the end, we as human beings can control that in our own communities, in our own houses. And when we put our heads down at night, yes, we're all worrying about the same thing, whether you're wearing red or blue or black or green. We're all worried about the same things. How am I going to be better tomorrow? How am I going to take care of my family? How am I going to take care of my, my loved one sitting next to me or myself? And so if you're struggling with that, you have to be strong enough to know that 
you've gone through hard times. I'm going to check my tough box off. I'm going to stand up. I'm going to make that phone call. I'm going to call someone that has a relatable feeling, maybe, maybe a friend of mine that's gone through something. I'm going to call them and talk to them. And you know what's going to happen? That friend's going to feel privileged. That friend's going to feel empowered, like, oh, my gosh. I'm gonna, you're calling me. And we're talking about a relatable experience that, that you had, and I'm, you're my guide now. You're making me the hero that I aspire to be. So we have to be there for each other, but you got to be able to make that phone call too, right? So yes. yeah, it's just all about love. It's all about love. And love. we're going to go a little bit long with our, with the, with our interview. I hope you're okay with Sorry. that. A little, no, I, 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 I believe this is important, especially the timing of our coming, coming together. I'm also a woman of faith and I believe that there's nothing, nothing is by accident, right? It wasn't by accident that you were where you were. You might've, you said you were at the right place at the right time, many would say, no, you were in the wrong place at the right time, right? <laughs> but in your heart and your spirit, it just came out that you were at the right place at the right time. So you could be, you could be utilized. And I think that's, that's, that's so telling about your character and, and you. beyond your character about the great orchestration, right? Of it all. So when you, you really come to a place where you're, you're, you're taking your experiences, your life experiences, your professional experiences, and you're packaging it in a way that inspires others because you found a deeper peace throughout it all, that resilience and empathy and, and, and those, those empowerment pieces that are so important, you are naturally going to attract a pretty massive audience because people can read you. They can read, is this fake? Is this put on? Is this scripted? Or is this real? And if it's real, something inside of humanity, something inside of us wants it. We want that resilience piece. We want that solid footing. And while you, you, know, you talk about getting e EDMR and getting yourself the therapy that you needed to get through that, and you talk very open and there's absolutely, absolutely no shame in that, right? <laughs> smart, smart move. But you're doing, yes, you're doing it for you, your family, but you're actually doing it for all those who get to be impacted by you. Because again, you're talking from your scars, not from your open wounds, even in your, in your weaker moments, that vulnerability comes through, but not pity me. It's let's utilize this. Let's, let's be, let me be a stronger individual so that we can be a stronger community. So we can be a stronger mm. country. So we can be a stronger mm. world. And mm. I just absolutely love mm. that you have taken, taken that to the next level. We, you want something done, ask a busy person. I said that to you before we started rolling. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about some of the other projects that you're involved in. One is directly related to your story, write a screen, screenplay, but all these other pieces, how can an emerging, emerging voice, an emerging speaker start getting their voice out there despite the kind of schedule that you, you have? Yeah. So thank you for that. I love listening to you talk as well. Just so articulated in the way you share your emotions. It's You can definitely tell you've gone through some things yourself and how that processes and how it comes out. It's awesome. I So I have, I started a book. I was asked to start writing, you know, my story and I'm about three quarters of the way through that. And it's a life story talking about uh, my sports uh, adventures to bits and pieces in my life leading up to the Las Vegas event and then the aftermath um, where I'm at right now. So I'm excited to get that out uh, as quickly as possible, but certainly I want to make sure it's right. I've There's a movie script being written on my story, which is really weird to... Like if this is a four year project that's been going back and forth with people in Hollywood and just different different people that have come into my life over this. So it's it's odd to like get excited about watching a movie about yourself, but it really does have a lot of really cool stuff in it. I grew up in a major league player's house. I grew up on a major league baseball field. I was I've been involved with three World Series championships. One with me as a scout, too, with my dad. I was a bat boy. There's all kinds of cool stuff. But there's also been a lot to me on, you know, that I'm very open about with my my relationship with my wife and how the struggles that we've had, you know, just on as a married couple and the fighting and things. We were literally 
almost getting divorced going to Las Vegas. We were on that plane fighting in text message going back and forth. And leading up to the, the first shot, we spent two and a half days of rebuilding and fell in love again. And that's what Vegas to us was always about. We had so much going on in our lives that we never had the communication skills. I was never empathetic. I was never open. I was never vulnerable enough to even listen. And then all of a sudden now I come out and I've got 1% battery life left walking to find her, right? Out of, uh, we all got out of Tropicana and now I'm walking around the, the casino and I'm trying to find her and I'm, this is like a movie. And I'm walking down this dark road and I've got elevated positions and I've, obviously I was just in a mass shooting and I've got stuff all over my clothes from carrying so many people out. And I'm walking up and I, I see the location and I it's the Desert Rose Resort and I go in through the door and she's coming in through the back door by the pool and we embrace right there and we kiss and it was wow. unbelievable. The touch of her lips was just, it put, took everything away that had just happened to me. Wow. And I will never, ever forget that. And so it's, it's amazing how if you allow your emotions to play a part in the decision-making process, I'm talking about your love, right? Yeah. Let the beast out. So the movie part, I think has a chance to really, it's faith-based. My book has faith in it. And it's not shoving it down your throat, but it's certainly tell you, telling you who I am as an individual. I feel that I am bonded by God. I feel I've got Jesus and all the angels above hovering over me all the time. And I, I, it's, it's just a feeling. I feel empowered by it and it makes me happy. And you know what? If that doesn't make you happy, then find somebody, find something to replicate my inner happiness and live a happy life because that's what I'm doing. So I've got, I've got a podcast that I'm really excited about. I'm sharing stories like you, stories of strength and resilience and people with compelling stories that want to be vulnerable and share that, which provides survival guides for others. So I've got a website that has my speaker platform on it. MLB Network and MLB.com, Major League Baseball, they did an incredible story on me a couple of years ago through Anthony Castro events. It's a it's an article that will make your eyes water up, make you think about life. They did a, a great job there. So I've got a lot of that in my TEDx talk. Fabulous. All of okay, that. So why don't you tell yeah. us, because I know by this time people <sighs> want more, right? So okay. tell us about how to get your TEDx talk, how to find you. Yeah. We've also got a good part of our listenership are speaker bookers, right? And so how does somebody reach out to you and connect? And do you have something for the average person who might be going through something? Or is it mainly your talks? Where can they find out more about you and your podcast? Let us know about that as well. <laughs> Yeah, so everything is on toddblylevin.com. And it's toddblylevin.com. That's my website. I've got my speaker page on there. I've got my my pro page. I've got my photos. I've got my, that's where I host my podcast from. So you can get into, I'm on Apple and Spotify, YouTube, all the different podcast channels. I've got a little piece on my book and what that's going to be about. So I've got the intro. And then I also have, if you join my website for free, you get access to a 12-page survival guide on how to walk tall. Mm. And it's got some really cool, it's a three-point process on no matter what you're doing, no matter who you are in your life, no matter where you're at, it's got three really cool stories that I think are relatable to everybody. And it talks about resilience, it talks about empowerment, it talks about being more vulnerable. And you can download that. It's a really easy read, uh, but it's just my way to be able to put stuff on. I also write poetry. I'm a huge poet. Wow. I learned that through my therapy. I've written a country song that is about to get recorded called Because He Just Had To. And I've written a rap song, believe it or not, on it's called A Warrior's Creed. And it's all about that inner strength that we have. So it's sing saying in like an M&M M &M, M &M style, modern rap. And I've got a gentleman, that's a young kid that writes melodies and he's right in the background side to this and it's super cool. So uh, I'm just embracing it. 
yeah, just, I'd really love to get out, talk more. And that's my whole goal. So many uh, facets to what you're doing and what you're about. And thank you. Yeah. Following that journey, I can't imagine there's not one person who's not going to get real value out of, out of just linking in. So everyone, Todd Blylevin, and that's be like boy, L-Y-L-E-V-E-N. So Bly, B-L-Y-L-E-V-E-N.com. Todd Blylevin. Definitely look him up. What's the name of your podcast? I'm going in. I am going in. I'm, I'm going in. I'm going I'm, in. Okay. I'm I going in. Him. Check yeah. him out. Link up. You will be transformed. Mm. And this is only the tip of the iceberg. You've got so much more coming, Todd. And it's just been an honor and a privilege to be able to have you speak in to our community, right? There are powerful voices out there that are the best kept secrets. Thank goodness you're no longer a secret. Let's say tragedy, this, this massive tragedy aside, there's so much about your voice that is powerful and will empower other mm -hmm. people. So this might've been your catalyst to really get, get it out there at, on the next level, but let's, let's not keep silent. There's too much good to do. There's too much love to spread. So now more than ever, right? Our voices are re really, really, really needed out there. So thank, thank you, you for getting yours out there and for giving all of yourself and beyond. This was such a great pleasure. And I really appreciate everything you're doing. You're an amazing interviewer. You just draw it out. So yeah, thank you so much for having me on. We really might have to honor. have a part two, Todd, because there's so much more I to, to dive into. <laughs> all right. So of yeah. course, this is Speak Pact, as you know. And what, what I would love my very high hand curated, hand chosen guests, because I know you have value that this audience needs. It will transform them and take them to their next milestone. So what is one thing in this pact to impact that we have going together and between us and the audience? What's one thing they can be begin to implement some, some simple tactical thing they can begin to implement to begin connecting with broader audiences. I think it's something that we've been discussing this whole time. I think you use my story, for example, I started out giving the details of what, where I went, where my boots took me that night. Everybody wanted to hear the details of my story for those eight hours. But what I really realized in through my journey over the last several years was the eight hours of craziness of what I went through set up act one. And it's really the final acts that make the true impact and lasting impact. So my recommendation would be understand the story that you're going to open eyes with, but then really hone in on the persona and the feelings that you're really wanting to express. What are you going to leave that audience with? What do you, what's the purpose of why you're wanting to either get into speaking or writing or doing something that's going to impact someone else? What are the three major trigger points that you're going to accomplish? So what are those solutions? And for me, like I mentioned, and you mentioned, it's the resilience piece. It's the being vulnerable. It's the empathy. It's the love. It's the character. I've got so many, all these different things that I love to try to touch on. But that's got to come from the heart and the soul. So it's not about you. It's about how your story can impact somebody else. You are the guide. Make someone else the hero. Mm. And coming from someone that people call me hero all the time, I don't want to be the hero. I want to be the guide. There's, I think the Han Solo part is much cooler than Luke Skywalker. I'm just saying. <laughs> but he's the guide. So... Yeah, that would probably be my biggest piece of advice is to really try to hone in on, on the impact that you're going to make. No pun intended, but it's the way it is, right? So Brilliant. Um, Brilliant way to wrap yeah. our whole conversation you. up. You are the guide. Make your audience the hero, right? It's not about Todd Blylevin and, and all the real, truly amazing things that you did that day and, and beyond the, the scope of your life. It's not about touting that, right? It's cool. about making your audience the hero in their own lives and helping them get to the next the next milestone in their journey right. so fabulous way to wrap mm -hmm. thank you thank you todd thank you ma'am i appreciate you having me on and for our incredible speak packed audience ciao ciao for now 
Thank you for listening to the Speak Pact podcast. To become a recommended speaker of Antoniet's WPC Speaker Agency, or you are a host or planner looking for a dynamic expert in optimized performance, Antoniet would like to personally meet with you. Secure a time with her at speakerbooker.com. Again, that is speakerbooker.com. It all begins with a vision, a voice, and a pact to impact. Join the Speak Pact movement by joining our new private Facebook group at the link in our show notes. Find us on nearly every social media platform at One Antoniet. That's number one, A-N-T-O-N-I-E-T-T-E, or simply hashtag SpeakPact.